Okay, uh, so um, a few weeks ago we had Ross uh, sharing with us um, examples of a, that they've seen um, across many different industries. It was quite fascinating. Um, and the uh, business models behind them. And one of the things that we had talked about and folks had um, ex expressed an interest in was to um, kind of get behind the covers. And uh, so today for that, uh, we have David. And uh, uh, before we get into uh, David's uh, presentation, maybe uh, we can get the introduction, Ross. Do you want to introduce yourself first and then David? And uh, you can get going. Sure. Hi, I'm Ross. I think I met a number of you last time I was here. Um, I'm a software engineer uh, at Bellino. I spent uh, a lot of time with IoT devices, and I spend a lot of time with customers and the various things they do with IoT devices. Cool. David? All right, my turn. Well, you can see my title right there. It says Developer Advocate. Um, so yeah, David Tischler, Developer Advocate at Bellina. Um, you know, I get to show off a lot of the cool projects that Ross builds, uh, our hardware hackers build, and I have the luxury of just simply demoing them. So it's uh, pretty, pretty awesome. Cool. All right. Do you want to share yeah uh, let's go get going um and while i do that um hans you scheduled what 90 minutes i think for this is that right you did an hour and a half yeah so if we can i mean uh, we can finish up maybe 30 40 minutes and get into questions well i only prepared six minutes worth of content so what do you uh, want to do for uh, the other 84 uh, then <laughs> 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 no, nah, we're good. Let me see. Um, is this coming through? Let's give that a moment. Yep. Fleet management for IoT devices. All right, perfect. So for some reason, I can't see it on my side, but that's okay. Um, let me come over to here, and let's make sure this is working. I might need to switch to that low definition mode um let's see but so that work you see a switch there yep okay perfect so we already discussed that there i am but um for those of you who were able to catch ross's presentation last month, you already know the answer to this, but for folks who may not have seen last month's presentation, um, the very first question I get asked uh, pretty much every day of my life is this, who is Bolina? And we had a little discussion about it in the uh, pregame show in the lounge at the table. So um, Cody, no, uh, no spoilers here, you already know. But if you have ever used Etcher, to flash an SD card or a USB stick uh, to um, to boot perhaps Linux or in the Raspberry Pi world, Raspbian, you have actually come across us before. So we build Etcher. Um, you know, it gets downloads upwards of millions of times per month and flashes millions of images per month. Um, so you may in fact have come across Bolina before, but actually the real product is called Bolina Cloud. So Etcher is an open source application and it gets a whole lot of downloads and a whole lot of eyeballs and you can fork it, you can clone it, you can build your own. That doesn't actually pay the bills. What really does is Bolina Cloud. And Bolina Cloud is a web-based control plane for IoT devices. And it gives you um, some granular breakdowns of your fleet. You can segment your workloads. You get your device information, your application information, terminal access to the devices, logs, container build info, and more. As a part of that are a few other pieces. Bellina OS, which is an open source operating system based on Yocto Linux. So we build our own OS 
those of you coming from the Raspberry Pi world, like I said, you might be familiar with Raspbian. We don't actually use that. We literally create our own operating system from upstream open source Yachtel. And then Bellina Engine, which is an open source container runtime. The thing was in the way, there we go. Um, based upon the Mobi contribution from Docker. Again, open source, um, and it is what um, runs the workloads on the devices. So that's the real platform. Develop, deploy, and manage fleets of connected devices. And Ross, any questions in thus far? Everybody knows what Etcher is, I imagine, then? No <laughs> questions yet. All right. So... <laughs> What do we mean by IoT fleet management? <laughs> Small hint, mass deployments of pies. Well, that may be true. When you have a Raspberry Pi or other device, could certainly be a Jetson Nano or any number of 50 some odd other types of devices that we support, and it is sitting on your desk, you can hook up a keyboard, a mouse, and a monitor to it and interact with it. It's literally right there, piece of cake. But when developing IoT projects, you suddenly find yourself with more than one of these. Now, how do you then interact with and manage, let's say, nine of them? Again, you could probably buy nine keyboards, nine mice, and nine monitors. Not really ideal. But at a certain point, it's just no longer feasible. When you have a fleet of devices, they might be all in one geographic region. They may be distributed literally around the world. They might not even be the exact same type of device. You get into a scenario where you need a way to manage the devices, push workloads to the devices, and ensure that the devices are online, connected, and doing what they're supposed to be doing. So that's, again, where we define fleet management. I get stopped at this point a lot of times and say, I thought we were talking about automotive fleets, but um, no, nope, not automotive. We're talking fleets of miniature computers and IoT uh, endpoints. You know, so again, if those devices are literally across the globe, you really don't want to have to get on an airplane and fly to each endpoint in order to push new containers or workloads to those devices. So that's what Bellina Cloud allows for. All right. Now, Ross, if I remember correctly, last month you gave an overview about the customers, the use cases, and some of the projects that we have kind of seen um, uh, from our customers. But I thought, you know, let's take a little deeper dive this month and get into some of the gory details. So um, if so you are correct, I left all <clears throat> the hard work to you. So now, this is good. You know. Uh, not, no, I'd, I'd say you actually did the hard work. <laughs> um, but let me see, would you, hold on, I see a question. Oh, it says, ask your questions here. <laughs> Hans got, got me. Um, so let's come back over here to the deck and we're going to talk a little bit about the architecture. I'll show off a little bit of what containerization looks like, what that means, and sort of what the workflow of deploying to a fleet of devices actually is. And then from there, I thought we could perhaps do a demo. Uh, better say my prayer to the demo gods first. Um, and then um, we'll sneak in a couple of lessons learned definitely along the way. So come over here. The first thing to cover, as I sort of mentioned earlier, is this bit called Bellina OS. So in the NVIDIA world, if you're familiar with using Jetson devices, NVIDIA builds what they call Jetpack. It's based upon Ubuntu and they include all of their drivers, all of their CUDA stack, all of their, um, all of their software uh, necessary to make their um, Jetsons run. 
I think that total build is somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10 gigs before you even start your workloads. So, you know, it's definitely not a slim operating system. Over in the Raspberry Pi world, there's Raspbian, as we mentioned, but we don't use either of those. We build our own and built upon Yocto. Yocto Linux, if you're familiar with that, is optimized and targeted for embedded devices and IoT use. It's minimal by design. We're very well aware of the fact that it does not include Firefox or even a desktop for that matter. It is a slimmed down, minimal by design for increased security OS. Um, that of course means lower RAM and resource requirements. And there's also a few bits and pieces in here that um, are specific to IoT devices such as redundant root FS partitions. And I have on here more tolerant of power loss and minimized SD card writes. We do not write the logs to the SD card. The SD card is always the Achilles heel of these kinds of devices. We'll talk about that more later. But um, redundant root FS partitions, let me come back to that one. What that means is there is an A side and a B side. So if you accidentally go to upgrade a device out in the field and it fails to boot back up, it will automatically roll back to the previous known good configuration. So you don't accidentally brick an entire fleet of devices with a bad update. Um, the operating system itself, again, obviously very small, then runs the Molina engine, which I also talked about. And that is the container runtime. So the concept and the theory here is that all of the workload, all of the applications that the customers are running are done within containers. We actually don't want to update the OS unless we need to. I should say we, I should say customers. It can be done, absolutely. I would still say you should try it on a test device first just to ensure that everything goes smoothly. But short of security patches, vulnerability patches, things like um, things that, you know, crop up zero days, um, you know, CVEs and whatnot that really truly do need to get patched. OK, I get it. But on your day to day operations, your day to day applications, all of that is intended to be run in containers leave the operating system alone as best as possible. Again, Belina Engine itself, like I said earlier, is based upon Mobi. Same thing, minimal by design. Docker was born in the data center. It has some assumptions that bandwidth is a plenty and connectivity and power are guaranteed. You know, in data centers, yeah you can pretty much guarantee you have power and connectivity. That's the whole point of a data center. But out in the world where IoT devices might live, you can't take those for granted. Um, you may or may not have connectivity. You may have 2G or 3G wireless uh, connectivity. So, um, you know, it's a constraint that you need to consider. So again, fault tolerance, Delta pools to save bandwidth is an important one there. Only layers that are updated that have changed are actually pushed down to devices. So if you have a container and yes, it is, you know, multiple gigs and you make small changes further down, I'll show you later on in the, um, in the Docker file, you can actually only push that binary difference to the device. Again, very important on slow cellular connectivity way off the grid. Um, again, lower RAM and resource requirements as well. So it gives you a little bit about Belina Engine. And then before I move into the workflow, I wanna clarify one thing. Belina Cloud is the platform, but Ross, you covered this last month the customers bring their own devices and write their own containers and applications. So we're providing that glue, that abstraction, that platform, but all of our customers, you know, if they're gonna purchase 500 Toradex 
SOMs or a thousand Jetson devices or whatever that case may be. It's their fleet of devices that they have deployed to their specific, uh, you know, maybe it's factories, factory automation, maybe it's logistics, maybe it's attached to the side of a vehicle, uh, could be stuck on a, you know, an oil well, whatever the case may be. They own the hardware, they deploy the hardware. They also write the application that's running on the hardware. We're really providing that management plane for the IoT device. So, any questions thus far? Nope, we'll just... One just came in. Uh-oh, uh-oh. This We've is got good. One. Moments Cody. go. Uh, bring them there... in, bring them in. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> okay. The question Cody. is, is there an automated process for Let OS general Cody and in. patch software updates, like major new releases? And does Belina Cloud support this? So the process is not automated. We build updated OSs on a very regular basis. We have an entire team dedicated to that process, but we do not automatically push out OS updates to devices. There's two reasons for that. Like I said, number one is that no matter what, you really do need to test an operating system upgrade before you deploy it to 1,000 or 10,000 devices. So no, we don't enforce an automatic update. And the second one is because, like I said earlier, just a moment ago, the customers own the hardware and the applications. We don't really know the best time for something like that to occur. So it's really up to the customer to trigger the process, to fire off the, I mean, it's literally just from a drop down menu, you choose it, you get a confirmation, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, is maybe they run workloads at night. Maybe they're, 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 um, data is something that, you know, again, being worldwide, we don't know, uh, you know, so it's just, it's up to the customer to trigger that process. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Cody. Okay. Let's drop into the workflow then. So it's pretty simple, honestly, create an account, create an application add your device and push your code. And you'll note there, it says create an application, then add your device. The reason is because an application is essentially the concept of a fleet. That's how you segment out whether it is these 50 devices are running workload number one and the next 50 devices are running a different workload or set of containers. The application is the segmentation. And you do that first, and then you start adding devices into that fleet. And all of those devices will run whatever code is deployed to that application. Pretty easy. Go to Belina.io, sign up. You can see there it says your first 10 devices are always free and full featured. That is true. We do not ask for a credit card. I do not want your credit card information until you get to device number 11. So you can deploy your first and nine more free of charge. It's fully featured. Um, knock yourself out. All you need is email and password. Get logged in and you come to the cloud dashboard. Now, this looks pretty barren. That's because, like I said, the very first thing we need to do is create an application. So we click the blue button and, oops, hang on a minute. Yeah, it's asking then for, um, I, I skipped one slide here. I, I am now realizing I cut one of them out, but um, when you create the application, it basically says, give the application a name, and choose the default device type that will be added. Um, and it will think for a moment, and then you have an application ready to go. It is an empty 
application. There's no container in it yet, and there are no devices in it yet. The next screen is, okay, add a device. So again, you click the blue button and it's appropriately labeled add device. And you get this pop up here. So you are in fact double confirming the type of device. I've got a Raspberry Pi 4 chosen here. And you choose a version and you can toggle between development or production. There's some hardening that's done on the production such as disable serial console um, and SSH access. You choose whether you want ethernet only or Wi-Fi plus ethernet. You can enter the Wi-Fi credentials there we don't save those credentials. I have no interest in knowing what your SSID or passphrase are. But what is done is they're injected via API into the creation of Bellina OS, which is grayed out at the bottom here. But you can see the blue button is download Bellina OS. And you can see the size is only 146 megs. That's compressed. It is about a gig uncompressed, but point being, your Wi-Fi credentials are passed through. The API takes them, injects them in, generates an OS on the fly, and downloads. And you know what comes next? Flash it with Etcher, of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, fire up Etcher, grab the image that you downloaded, write it to your SD card, and power up. So now. At this point, you have a Pi or a Jetson Nano or whatever target device you have chosen. Beagle Bones are supportive as well. Uh, Beagle Bone Black, Green, and there's one more. Green W, I think. I can't remember. Um, but um, at the end of the process, here's what you get. Your device is now online. When it boots up, it essentially checks in with Bellina Cloud. It's done over a VPN tunnel that gets created from the device up to our Bellina Cloud servers. And that is essentially then the link between the two. Now in this screenshot, sure, I've only got one device for now, but you can continue to flash that same image SD card over and over and over, and they will continue to then populate in here as you add more and more and more of them. That's how you build up your fleet. Now, this, we click on, I click on the device itself, and you get a little metadata about it. Uh, it does have a status indicator, tells you a little bit about the host OS version, the supervisor version. The supervisor is responsible for the container orchestration on the device IP address. You can see logs coming off of it and terminal, you get SSH access to the device and its containers. So at this point, we have a device, it's online, but there's still no sign of a container anywhere. So let's talk about where those come from. Actually, let me pause. Any questions roll in yet? Ross, no new questions. Else? No, well, if we don't get any questions, Ross, you're gonna have to start making some up. I got you, okay. <laughs> I'll sing all day until last All questions. right. All right. Uh, folks, ask your questions in the yeah. questions box or raise your hand. Yeah. Um, so we've got our device online. It is connected. It is doing absolutely nothing thus far. <laughs> Let's add a container. To do that, there's a couple different ways. We'll start off with this methodology here. We provide some native tooling called the Bellina CLI. And it's obviously command line interface that allows you to interact with the devices, the applications, build and push your containers. You can also actually um, reach the devices via SSH as well using it. Um, so you do need to install that on your machine. You can see here, it's pretty, pretty easy to get going. Um, the instructions are there. I'll also, Hans, I'll send you this deck afterwards uh, to post in case anyone wants to come back through. Uh, follow along or, you know, grab any of these links off of here. 
Sounds good. Easy enough to install it though. And once you have it installed, you now have a command called Belina. Belina help just spits out all of the options there. Still actually don't have a container though. So we need to get a container. Can go about that one of two ways. If you know how to write a Docker file and you have an application in mind, uh, maybe you've already containerized it, have at it. You can just start writing your Docker files and I'll show you one in a few minutes when I hop out from the deck. We'll go take a, a live look around and, and away you go. On the other hand, a lot of folks need a little assistance getting going and a little bit of inspiration on best practices and how to build the containers, how to manipulate the containers. So we have a team of hardware hackers that build projects. Literally, their full-time position is creating IoT applications that, remember, I said you can use for up to 10 devices for free, uh, whether that's one, nine, or 10, no problem or you can sort of use them as a hop off point to then build your own. But I thought, okay, let's just take a quick look at what it entails to use one of the sample ones. So I'm using here Bellina Sense, and that's build an air quality monitor with InfluxDB, Grafana, and Docker on a Raspberry Pi. We post all of these projects on our blog and on GitHub. You can see the URL there is github.com slash Bellina Labs slash Bellina Sense. I have it here as well. Um, and you can just simply clone this and it's ready to go. Obviously, you need some hardware. It is designed for a Pi with a BME 280 or 680 sensor for temperature, humidity, and um, uh, pressure. Uh, it also has air quality, uh, which is done based on an approximation. You can use, I want to say, CCS811, I think, is the name of the sensor that will give you a more accurate total particulate count. But anyways, point being, at the end of cloning this and then pushing it to the device, you come away with a fully functional project. So let me come back over here. And we'll take a look at what that looks like. Okay, cloning is easy enough. Git clone, there's the URL for it. In the screenshot here, and again, we'll, we'll do a little bit of this live, um, time permitting, but um, you, know, you can kind of see, okay, after it's been cloned, you now have the contents of that repo locally. And you can inspect the Docker files themselves. You can see what one looks like there. I, I can see already the text is a little small on here. So we'll drop out and come over to a real um, VM in just a moment. But uh, point being, uh, that's what a Docker file looks like. And then using the Bellina CLI that we installed earlier, we log in, Bellina login asks you for those credentials that you created earlier. And then we can do a Bellina push followed by the application name that we created earlier in the process. What that will do is package up all of that directory, the Docker files and any other artifacts, push them up to our cloud builders, the builders will run through that Docker file. A Docker file is essentially a recipe. It's just a script. At the end of it, the container is built and Bellina Cloud will then push it to all of the devices that are in the fleet, whether that is one, 100, or 1,000, doesn't matter. It essentially orchestrates it out and those devices then download the container. That of course does mean they need connectivity of some sort, whether that's Wi-Fi, ethernet or cellular, but they'll download the container and start running that workload. 
at the end, <laughs> there's the, that's your success. That's how you know you have achieved success is if you see the unicorn, that's Charlie. <laughs> so in this Bellina Sense example, there were one, two, three, four, five containers built. Influx, Grafana, uh, Sensor, which is pulling the data from the sensors themselves, Telegraph, and MQTT. Here's what it looks like when you're viewing the details of the device. It's now pulling down its set of containers, its workload. So you can watch it, download those, the logs start spitting out what is occurring. And um, at the end of it, it will uh, literally begin running Bellina Sense, which is a dashboard such as, hold on, oh, not on there. Well, you can see it here, but um, it's over on the blog post. Let me see if we have a link to the blog post. We should, no, not in here. Hmm, go figure. Well, we'll get that in a minute, no problem. All right, so let's take a pause there. That gives you an overview of the gruesome details of adding an application, adding a device, and pushing a container, building and pushing a container onto the device. And this would be a good timing for a question that just came yeah. in from Carl. All right, what do we have? Uh, well, Hans may be able to bring Carl to the stage. Maybe we can let, ask Carl to ask the question. Gee, guys, I already had my 15 minutes of fame last week. <laughs> Hans, you're giving me too much, too much amenities here. Uh, Carl, you're welcome anytime. Um, Go for it. I, yeah, no, I think this is great. Um, my question is interesting only from the aspect of, listen, we're doing everything remote. And after you set up these sensors on these fleet management trucks, they obviously traveling around the, the country and the world, and they're remote too. I have heard that in addition to monitoring the, the, the status for any kind of status change uh, for, the, for, for the tracker, they actually have smart locks that they put on the vehicles outside of the trucks. Are you familiar with that? It's, it's actually a sensor itself. Hmm, I was not, but I mean, anything pretty much nowadays can in fact be quote unquote smart or quote unquote connected. So yeah. um, I, it I'm, doesn't I'm, necessarily I, surprise I, me. Yeah, I'm playing devil's av advocate here. I think what great, by the way, great presentation again, David, uh, but I'm playing devil's advocate here because what we're trying to do is attest that the data is real because data can be fudged. And so I come, I'm coming at it from a very different standpoint than you are. You're just mm -hmm. trying to explain how IOT works, uh, how basically you mm -hmm. use, um, how you use the IOT and the sensors in the field and you collect the data, you pull the data in real time. I got it. I think a lot of our sure. other guests got it. I think that's great, but I'm involved in measuring if that data is real or not. And then if the data is real, how you monetize. Um, you cut it? out at the very last bit, Carl, but I think I got it. And at, you're absolutely no, right. The data integrity. Data integrity. In this, yeah, in this particular case, I am showing you a sample application that was built by the hardware hacker team at Bellina just to show simple measurements coming off of a device. Mm -hmm. in, our, in our population of customers, the data integrity would be up to them because remember I did mention that the customers own their own hardware and build their own applications. They are the ones that write their own containers for whatever type of environment it is that they're, um, you know, or, or whatever their industry or use case is. If it is something that is attached to the side of an oil rig, 
I should hope that they have some sort of physical security in place so that people can't simply walk up to an oil uh, drill, you know, an oil well um, and start monkeying around with it. I would also hope that if a device uh, is going to be, you know, like you say, attached to the side of a truck, what is to prevent anyone from grabbing the device and walking off with it? I mean, is it attached by magnets? Is it bolted down? Is it got a padlock on it? Like how, like the physical security again would be up to the customer because they are placing devices wherever they need to go. The second piece of it is you are correct. The data also would need to be secured in some manner. Now, Again, it would be left up to them. Is it just simply encrypted, transmitted, decrypted? Is it perhaps there are, now this is not my area of expertise, so maybe someone correct me if I get a little astray here, but I've seen um, keys be exchanged actually over DNS now, and there is... Oh, I can't think of the name that this was proved out. This Ross, I don't know if you've heard of this before, but essentially what in the in the browser world is an SSL, you know, HTTPS colon slash slash. Yeah. There are ways to verify and validate that the device that you are communicating with is in fact who they say they are via DNS. Um, I, I just, I don't know the correct name or terminology, but it's, it's essentially a security layer at the DNS level. Um, so the long story short is that it's up to the customers and the customers would have to think about what makes the most sense for them. Yeah, just, just think COVID-19 vaccines, and then you see how secure they need to no, be, right? totally. My yeah. God. <laughs> yeah, no, totally, right. totally makes sense. I mean, if you are the one in charge of distributing the COVID-19 vaccine, I absolutely hope you have an armed guard, 10 padlocks, and... I we don't, don't know on the, it. you know, on each vial, I mean, RFID or whatever. The point is, is... We at Bellina, that would be up to the customer and yeah. how they go about you have, it. Yeah, you have to do it that way. It has to be a diplomatic process yeah. from your standpoint because you don't you don't drive the you know you're not driving. Yeah. Standard, so I get it. No. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. very much, David. Yep. Thanks, no Carl. Maybe you Thank you, Carl. Maybe have a conversation with David and Ross afterwards. Maybe you guys can integrate. Uh, I, I don't know. know. That's about the extent well, of my knowledge. Well, I, I, was going, <laughs> I, was, I was going to get to the point, and I didn't want to make this a personal pitch, but I was going to get to the point that all of these uh, sensors with the modules in the field need a way to attestate the integrity of the data. And actually, the blockchain is the best way to do that. It's just that for lots of uh, uh, people right now, using integrating IoT with the blockchain appears to be a deer in the headlights moment, but it's not for us. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, sorry. Um, all right. Yeah, get no, me off, get like me I off, say, get me makes, off. Uh, thanks, yeah. Carl. <laughs> yeah, like I say, I mean, the customers, not so, necessarily Bellina, would be the ones who would, you know, they, they, they absolutely should. I certainly hope they are thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, if I can interject, David, mm -hmm. there's a point of freedom and fun in the midst of that, and that yeah. we give customers this mechanism to get their application out into the world and to control it and update it and so forth, but we deliberately don't handcuff them. We don't prescribe, other than using containers, how they do things. Uh, so they have this tremendous freedom and flexibility to do whatever they want inside their containers. Uh, so as fun that gets to talk to customers all the time, it's really fun because they'll tell me, oh, yeah, and I'm doing this in the containers and we're doing that to communicate with this over there. It's like, mm -hmm. wow, I didn't know you could do that, right? And it's just so we have customers that are yeah. very innovative and doing fun things, and we don't restrict them. No. We're not forcing them into any kind of framework that uh, causes them to have to do things a certain way. Nope. I enjoy, you know, seeing what customers are doing and honestly just learning from the way in which they containerize their applications as well. 
Um, so I'm looking at the clock, and I did speak for more than six minutes. I apologize. <laughs> so let's take a quick look at some scaling and fleet management, some best practices, some lessons learned. Um, maybe you can avoid some mistakes in your projects that I have seen made. <laughs> but um, So first things first. I did show earlier, you know, just what one device looks like, but I had mentioned the fact that applications are clusters of devices, groups of devices that are all running the same workload. Here you can see one that's mixed with Pi 4s and Jetson Nanos. After I took this screenshot though, I actually thought to myself, you know, we can use this as a talking point here. I would say that this is not a best practice. And the reason is this, these devices, all of them make up one application. They are all running the same workload. I would say in this scenario, if you were using Jets and Nanos, those are typically used for some edge AI, some light inferencing, you know, they have the GPU on them and the NVIDIA software stack. A Raspberry Pi 4 is not typically done uh, or not typically used for an AI workload. So let's just say hypothetically here that these devices were, um, you know, running environmental sensors, I would place those on the Raspberry Pis. They are cheaper. I would move those to a different application and then only push my AI containers and workloads to those Jets and Nanos that could be used for some machine vision, computer vision, uh, deep learning, et cetera. So mixing and matching those two device types running the exact same workload, mm, maybe not actually the best practice here. Instead, I would probably create two applications, segment them, push one set of containers to the pies with their dedicated hardware on top, whether it's a, you know, um, a BME 680 or whatever, or a pie hat, and then a different series of containers to those Jetsons. Um, fleet, you know, kind of just showing off real quickly. The devices, once they come online, you can see them all around the world and interact with them, like I said, via that terminal that's in the console. So you can connect to devices. I do this all the time. Um, we are a remote first organization. We have team members all around the world. I connect to devices literally across the globe. Some best practices though. The SD card, as I said earlier, is the Achilles heel of an IoT device. I don't know if any of you have come across dead SD cards yet, but I promise if you start deploying at scale, you will. And if you buy cheap SD cards, they will fail. I promise. We see it day in and day out at Bellina. Customers will try to save a couple of dollars. I don't blame them. I get it. It is tempting to buy cheap SD cards, but they will stop working. And when they stop working, your IoT device is now dead, dead in the water. Um, the speed also matters. That one right there is a class three. Well, it's actually a class 10 U3. Um, they also come in speed ratings of A1, A2, A3. The faster, the better. The thing about it though is this, no matter what, an SD card was never really truly intended to be a constant on off read write operating system for a computer living on this type of medium. I think if I know my history, that came about due to digital cameras and digital cameras, you know, you take a picture, it writes to it. Okay, fine. How many pictures are you going to take? Really? Is it going to be alive 24 seven? Are you literally taking pictures all day long around the clock? No, the reliability of these things, the actual blocks, storage blocks, the cells, they're just cheaply made. 
You know, a 64 gig SD card like that is $10. It's not the same quality material wise as what is in an enterprise grade SSD or even a spinning disc for that matter. So depending upon the size of the device, some devices do actually have M.2 slots. Some devices may even have an SSD or SATA port, like an Intel Nook is a good example of that. Um, the point is more reliable storage is better. I promise. <laughs> um, so, you know, at least if you're going to choose devices that rely on an SD card, at least get high quality cards. Better than that, though, would be something with EMMC or M.2 for a SATA drive. Just far more reliable and faster. In that same vein, hardware selection. Again, your IoT project, this is critical. I know that that device on the left is a Raspberry Pi Zero, which cost a total of $5, and people try to use them for everything under the sun. In the middle, there's a Bellina Fin, total shameless plug there. We do build some hardware, but let's move over to the right, and that's actually, um, I want to say that that might be a Varus site. I can't remember if that's a Varus site carrier board or perhaps a Toradex. Either way, the point being that is an enterprise grade industrial strength, certified and well-engineered two to three to $400 piece of equipment. Okay. I know that money matters. I get it. I'm just saying that if you go and place that $5 Raspberry Pi out in the wild, perhaps in the canopy of the jungle, or I keep coming back to this oil well analogy, because we do have customers doing that, or I live in Phoenix up on my roof, that $5 Pi will die. It will not survive in the wild very long. Um, so again, just keep in mind, where is your device going to live? If it's going to be in an air conditioned factory, you know, just simply hanging from a rafter. Okay, fine. You might be able to get away with it. But if it's going to be out in the wild, you need to consider more enterprise grade hardware. Um, any are you going to tell the Yeah, go ahead. Are you going to tell the donkey story? I thought for sure you were going to tell the donkey uh, story. I was, in fact, going to okay. tell the donkey story. Uh, okay. um, the donkey story goes as such. <clears throat> we have a customer. I am obviously not going to name names. Actually, uh, they, you wouldn't have ever heard of them anyway. But they have deployed Raspberry Pi Zeros out into the wild. And I mean way off the grid. And they use these Pi Zeros and they are trying to run a pretty sizable workload on these Pi Zeros. And they chose really, really cheap, unreliable SD cards. And so one day I was doing support. All of us at Bellina do support and that's a good thing. We monitor our forums and our paid support tickets that come in from customers. This customer says, hey, I'm having trouble reaching my device. Can you take a look? Okay, sure, no problem, you know. So I go to take a look. Okay, where's the device? Well, it's offline. Well, that's not good. Um, let me see if I can reach it via another device to try to like man in the middle, hop to it. No go. Um, Lo and behold, you know, back and forth, troubleshooting, have other engineers take a look in case I'm missing anything. But at the end of the day, the device was just offline, period. I don't know why, but we couldn't find out. So we said, all right, you're going to have to go power cycle the device. Can you go power cycle it? Let's see if it just reboots. He says, no, that's going to be an issue. All right. Well, why, why not? I could, I mean, I think that's the next step in the troubleshooting process is to reboot. 
He says, yeah, I'm going to have to dispatch a courier on a donkey. I think he might have said mule. I can't remember if it was donkey or mule. And it was going to take three days to get to the device before that courier could power cycle the device. And it would then take three days for him to return on mule back. Uh, and I got to be honest, I'm not sure what the end result was, if it was the SD card that failed or the Pi that failed. Either way, it was six days round trip <laughs> to get to, to power cycle that Pi Zero. So um, needless to say, um, quality hardware might just make up for the, <laughs> the, <donkey laughs> the investment, the cost. Yeah. So, David, um, we, we do have a question here, which I yeah, can just directly answer because Cody did a very nice job of phrasing his question. And the question is, can you share some of the things you've seen your customers doing uh, that are cool? Uh, and that's a shameless mm -hmm. plug for my presentation yes. from last month, uh, which sure is now is. posted on YouTube. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can go uh, check that out. And that's I was trying to tell those stories yep. there. So that really is the right place to go and, and watch. Yeah, definitely, Cody. Um, Ross covered some really neat things. I'll just say um, just like super high level two minutes. Um, we have customers that use drones to do aerial photography and site surveying of large scale infrastructure construction jobs. Um, so that's super cool. Um, we have customers that do marine uh, seabed mapping. Um, they use autonomous subs to take highly targeted, detailed ocean floor topography. Um, and those are super cool in that when the sub is at the surface, they can load its, um, you know, its GPS uh, boundaries that it needs to go and map. But once it's underwater, it has no connectivity. It's autonomous. So the sub goes down, maps the location, and returns back up. Um, and they can do all of that out in the field, literally on board the vessel. It's just program the coordinates that they want to map. But anytime they want to update the software, you know, you like I said earlier, you need connectivity. So whether that's over satellite or, you know, come back to shore, um, they can, uh, you know, update the devices themselves. And for those of you in Seattle, which is probably most of you, um, if you go to one of your local QFCs, like the one in University Village grocery store, there's an in-farm display there where they actually grow things like basil and herbs right there in the store from seeds. And inside um, each one, and this is like a big end cap over in the fruit and vegetable section, and each one of those in-farm displays and supermarkets spread across the world has both Bellina hardware and Bellina software inside. So if you're a fan of fresh basil, go give it a try. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Is that a project that we can uh, learn about on the blog? <laughs> in farm i yes. think yeah has there's a, case. a i think yeah, there's, there's a, a right case up study. there yeah yep mm -hmm. but really go try the basil first <laughs> yes before you bother reading before an article <laughs> thanks so much yeah That's right. thanks Cody. all right any others roll in Ross, or we? Carl had a comment. I think that was when you had your SD card about the security of an SD oh, card. Oh, yeah, 1% <laughs> security. No, no chance. I mean, it can be removed from the device, physically removed. That is okay. actually one additional from a security standpoint. That is a good talking point. Um, that's, that's a good point out there. Let me go back to that and go back. Okay, yeah. If you do not ensure physical security of the device. If the device is literally out in the countryside, in the wild, environmental monitoring is a you know prime example of that. And I, and I get it, but um, yeah, someone could just walk off with the device. Um, if the data is in fact critical, uh, it's, it's a goner. At the very least, if you have something with some sensitive data, choose a device that has EMMC that has to be flashed you 
you would it can be done, but you need very specialized equipment to desolder an EMMC. Um, I happen to have one on my desk, and it's a ball grid array of 153 pins. In order to remove it from a device and not damage it, and then resurface mount it to another PCB or target um, board, like you, you need to know what you're doing. I'm not saying that it cannot be done, but it's a different ball game than plop out an SD card. So, um, yeah, good, uh, good, good well, shout out. Yeah, David, yeah, I, was, uh, I was just wondering about in terms of <clears throat> that poor mule and donkey. I'm, I'm thinking Arizona, right? I'm thinking Arizona. I'm thinking Grand Canyon. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, nope. It wasn't here. It was in South well, America. Oh, okay, okay. Because I'm afraid from the exact country, but. <laughs> <laughs> but the question is, um, in terms of, just think about that use case. You have to send a donkey down, probably you know somewhere in rough desert-like terrain. Why, why, why couldn't? Why isn't it using? Was it using an embedded sim, uh, and then using a remote, you know, provisioning? <clears throat> for these devices. I guess we're talking too much. <laughs> There's the lesson learned. <laughs> <laughs> because it was not doing that and because you're right. The customer, again, I'm not, you know, hey, they learned a valuable lesson. That wasn't actually the only time that that has happened. They're now rethinking their hardware strategy. I get that. But I'm saying don't put yourself in that position from the outset. Right. In those scenarios... They should have chosen something other than a $5 Raspberry Pi Zero <laughs> and a cheap SD card because it cost them a fortune exactly. just in the recovery of yeah. the device. Well, but then again, that's your job security. Come on now. <laughs> well, I mean, well, I, we don't, you know, I don't care if they provision a Raspberry Pi Zero or something more enterprise grade from Verisite, you know? Um, right, because you just want to solve the problems. And I think you exactly. I think you have to be I think you have to kind of say, well, you know, guys, an, an SD card and and no ability to remotely provision the device in the field means that you're gonna on constantly send those donkeys. Exactly. I mean you're gonna have a fleet of donkeys to go with your fleet of devices. <laughs> so <laughs> the so yeah, you need to think about the the ramifications of the project from the outset. Just spend the extra hundred dollars up front. I know, I get it, budget and how much, but it's guys. I want to. I want to. I want to change the topic just a little yep. bit, but it's actually quite relevant here. Yep. Um, recently, this week, I don't know if you guys, you know, Hans is very savvy. He probably saw this recently. T-Mobile has. Um, uh, uh, had a press release about ag tech in Snohomish County. You know, there's lots of agriculture. Mm -hmm. There's lots of mm -hmm. lots of cows and sheep. Mm -hmm. and a lot areas. of ag tech customers we have, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I just noticed uh, that, you know, they're, they're pushing sort of an ag tech theme at T-Mobile uh, to try to push more IoT services. Um, and that kind of comes back to uh, why. Wh 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 what's the purpose, right? Is it to, is it to make sure those cows are feeling nice and producing the best quality milk? What's the deal there? Um, um, is it to make sure that our Roman lettuce, if we're growing any, or our grapes are are healthy? Uh, I mean, your 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 technology would have tremendous applications there. Have you? Did you hear? Did you see this announcement with T-Mobile uh, and the five G Open Innovation Labs? They had a joint announcement this week. T-Mobile is pushing a Snohomish County ag tech uh, project. Just thought you guys might be aware of that. Uh, I have not seen that. Ross, you're local up there, so if it's something you've seen, perhaps, but not not me down here. I haven't seen it, but it's not surprising. I mean, yeah. Agriculture is a big part of the economy. There's def there are absolutely ways technology can help with that. There was a previous IoT uh, Hub presentation uh, regarding that, uh, everything uh, from crop monitoring to weed removal. And I, I think we've only seen the start of what mm -hmm. ag, ag tech cool. can do. Right. And if you actually, if you look at what um, Google Moonshot and some of the projects that they have there, there are a number of them around ag tech. Right. It's, they're doing some, you know, it's moonshot stuff. So some of those things won't work, but some of them will. Um, so we'll see some more ag tech stuff coming from 
various sectors. So, so you guys but, don't necessarily even get into discussions with mobile network operators because that's the job of the end user, right? Yep. Correct. I see. I see. I see. Yep. Because fully what, yeah, what modem they want to run, of course, matters from a hardware perspective. But beyond that, they can choose any provider and, you know, they can choose their own data plan, what their connectivity rate or data rate is, you know, might vary by the megabyte or gigabyte. Um, it's all, you know, and again, who knows where the device is going to be. You need to make sure that's a good talking point from a global perspective or best practice of choosing a global modem that can hop mm -hmm. on any uh, frequency or any band, um, even if it costs you a couple dollars more, might save you a lot in logistics nightmares later of swapping out, um, you know, Quectel, EC25As, Es, or Gs, um, and then the MVNOs or you know whether you're using like Particle or Hologram or AT and T or uh, Orange or Vodafone, uh, it's, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of the Twilio, we have these Twilio super sims that we use that have global coverage. Um, so yeah, yet another consideration uh, to take into account. All right. Thank you, Carl. I'm going to, uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, if you want to hang around later, uh, you can ask the, actually the e -sim yep. Interesting. Actually, I was going to propose to you to get those dudes at T-Mobile uh, to come and sit in and discuss this because yes. They yeah. love PR. Who doesn't love PR? Come on. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. I'm off again. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> hi, Elridge. Welcome. You had two hi, questions. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, um, David, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for the hub of great information. Um, I was wondering, um, what is the ideal customer journey um, from problem validation to product delivery with, with Balena. And the second question is really related to uh, the best practice you provided. As a pre-sales engineer, the first thing I talk to my customers is redundancy. So mm -hmm. um, how does um, Balena uh, you know, facilitate redundancy with, with customers, especially with very, very low um, um, entry uh, prices for uh, whether it's the hardware or the, 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 the eSIM card? Thank you. Yeah. Well, actually, Ross, do you want to handle that one? I, I'm i thinking you probably have the best perspective there on, you know, what that life cycle, what that journey looks like. Sure. So the, the good news is that there's not a specific ideal customer journey here, uh, in part because what we provide as technology is really th this way of for scaling an application. So we don't put a lot of constraints on what people can do. So we're not forcing them into a particular way of doing things. So, which means that customers come to us in a variety of different ways. Sometimes customers come to us when they just have their first idea about what they want to do with the system and they want to talk it over with somebody, which we're happy to do. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, sometimes customers come to us that already have a fleet of 5,000 devices um, and they don't have a, they're frustrated with their management system for working with those and how their growth is inhibited by that and they bring those devices into our system. So those are two very different starting points, uh, but they both work. Um, if you I'm plugging my own presentation again, but if you go back, <laughs> uh, I see to, what you've done here. Uh, if you go back to the presentation I gave about a month ago, there are a lot of customer stories in there, and I uh, that you can hear about how customers found us, when they found us, um, and what they did from there. Um, so it's, and I think you find some good, fun stories in there about uh, what their journey has been like. I mean, I could go into more standard things here about, well, it's best when customers really know what they want and those sorts of things. But it's really a whole variety of stories of customers that have come in and been successful and and raised fleets on the platform. Cool. Another plug for the video. It's on. There you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kevin. Hans Thank told you. me to. So there is going to handle the redundancy, please, right. uh, because um, you can have multiple um, um, other Raspberry Pi or 
or a different uh, hardware you know installed outside but until they are actually plugged into the services how do you handle the, trans the transition so your, your question of, is about uh, as written was about redundancy so do i correctly interpret that is like okay so you've got um someone has a network or a fleet of a thousand devices and they're globally distributed um but if there's just one in each of those locations, let's take David's oil well example. It could be, if you don't like oil, if, uh, make the example windmills, right? Sure. And if you're talking about if one of those devices goes down, what do you do about it? Do you put some redundancy on site? And that, again, is kind of up to the customer, right, what they want to do in those situations. The good news with a system like ours is that they have knowledge of what's going on across their fleet. So if they see, like, okay, all of my devices are healthy, that's great. Or they may see that these, this uh, two or three percent of their fleet are offline for whatever reason, for network issues or device failures and so forth. They have knowledge of that so they can see what's going on and take the appropriate action for those. So don't, yeah, it's not a, there's that, that's talking about the, you know, the devices uh, and where they are out in the field and, and customers can do things with that. If you're talking about what we do on the server side of things, I mean, that's a more traditional story where we have, you know, in the way that we do, we have excellent uptime and so forth. So, but David, did you want to add anything to that? About no, I redundancy? think you covered it. I mean, really, that's exactly what it comes down to is, um, Redundancy, I would say, is yet again, you know, up to the customer. If the workload is truly critical and truly needs, you know, secondary coverage, third, you know, triple redundancy, um, the customer would be responsible for landing two or three devices at that site, at that, at that location. Um, Let's also then assume you get into these planning games then, right? Um, look, if it's mission critical, um, yeah, I would put two devices out there and I would ensure that they have two different power sources. And I would also check to see if I could get a hold of two different cellular or network providers so that there is some redundancy. Because let's say you have you know, T-Mobile, we used them. I, mean, I shouldn't, you know, throw them under the bus. But um, look, if you put two, dev two devices out in the field side by side monitoring a windmill and T-Mobile goes down, it doesn't matter if you have two devices or 200 devices at that site. Who cares? They're all offline. So, um, you know, you have to sort of balance the risk and the cost of what that would um what that would entail you know if it's a windmill eh, maybe not the end of the world but if it's a hydroelectric dam <laughs> and it's some sort of mission critical um service yeah i would get a secondary power supply and a secondary network right. um to you know to to ensure uh redundancy and we do have some visibility yeah into this. I mean, the customer has visibility into their own fleets and we have visibility mm. across fleets. Yeah. And, you know, David's on support um, all the time. And it's, you know, the device failures, as long as you're dealing with enterprise grade devices uh, out in the field, the device, the hard device failures are actually quite unusual. Yeah. Uh, which is great. Much more common is some sort of network issue. Um, or um, yeah. application problems, right? Where yeah. the application itself is has some unreliability or it's doing dumb things like mm. filling disk, disk partitions and things like that. But actual enterprise class IoT hardware failure is pretty uncommon. Yeah. You know, and if you happen to push a container that has an error um, and the workload doesn't run, I mean, it's as simple as fixing it locally on your machine and running a new Bolina push replacing the container that's quite honestly the entire purpose <laughs> right. so all right thank you Arij. yep milan had a question so milan go ahead yeah go yeah, ahead milan I'm, I'm really liking the discussion i kind of wanted to piggyback on this and wanted to mention uh 
you guys talking about SD cards, this is the main reason when, because my uh, hobby is uh, video on top of IoT. This is why people for red cameras and high cost projects don't use SD cards. They use mm -hmm. solid state drives that usually cost five to 10 times more than a regular right. hard drive yep. because you can lose the footage and you're done. Absolutely. So that's very important kind of ties into the whole discussion and I keep thinking of maintainability because that's kind of my background. Mm -hmm. But my question to you guys is, because IoT is a buzzword. Everybody's talking about it. You oh, get yeah. Alexa at home and everybody thinks more of that side than anything else. Um, it's IoT and the IIoT. It's two separate things that people don't necessarily co uh, connect uh -huh. together. Um, what do you think the trend of the industry or what do you see it's going at um, more enterprise level stuff that they're thinking or are people just kind of throwing some homebrew idea with whatever they can afford to begin with and then go upgrade it later on kind of just curious what what do you see happening is it going somewhere where it's going to be more reliable and have two fields where you do your home stuff which is not remotely close to what the industrial part looks like well there's so much going i mean hans maybe yeah i was just gonna say you know who comes to that the uh, all the presentations because he sees all the trends but from our vantage point there's so much going on right so people can say hey what are the trends within belina and like well, we got customers doing everything, right? And we see growth in lots of different areas. We say, oh, well, we see lots of growth and inferencing on the edge, and that's absolutely yeah. true. Well, we see lots of growth in ag tech, and that's absolutely true, right? So it's just such an explosion of things going on. You, you know, it's hard to say that's the most important trend because there are just so many things. Yeah, I would agree. But Hans, you have no, a, I would agree. Yeah. It's, you know, Today, I think a lot of it is, is pretty custom to each customer, each industry, right? Um, there's plenty of use cases, but many of them are also, I think the, the bigger problem is the number of projects get that stuck um, just in POC and never actually make it into production. Um, but that has nothing to do with the tech, it's usually internal issues, funding issues, yeah. That's that's very encouraging because I'm trying to kind of figure out how I can be part of the IoT without actually be an engineer <laughs> or a program or anything like that. But I like solving problems, yeah. so I want to <laughs> kind of get into a, that field. But it sounds like it's everywhere, mm -hmm. so yeah. it depends on what you're yeah. interested. You can get an IoT, be pharmacy yeah, or out in the field. Absolutely, that's right. the sky's the yeah. limit. Which is great yeah, news. everything is getting connected. Especially yep. after COVID. Every single right. industry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Milan. David, are you doing a demo here no, for us? No, you know, while we were talking, I just flashed an SD card. Well, I did a Git clone of the Bolina Sense repo. And, and let's see, actually, it might still be building in the background. But while we were chatting, I just went through the process that I described in the deck. Um, oh, no, we do have Charlie. Charlie's yeah, there. So I did the Git clone. I did the Bolina push. And the containers just finished building. I flashed the SD card onto uh, using Etcher, inserted into... A Pi 3 that happens to have a sense hat on top of it and a sense hat I forgot about the fact has all those LEDs on top. So I apologize. That's what that bright light is um, I'll switch the camera back actually in a moment and that was not that interesting to watch it boot up, but um, Let's see here, but the device you can see in the dashboard it, well, first of all, it appeared. Then after it appeared, uh, I clicked on it, and we can see it's now downloading its containers. So really went through the whole thing in a matter of moments that uh, I should have just done it that way the first time instead of the slideware. But, um, you know, simple as, simple as that. Alternatively, like I said, customers, they will 
people tend to look at these projects that we build as starting points, but really what they're doing is crafting their own containers. But, you know, here's a simple Docker file for InfluxDB, right? You know, grab from a repo, add a package, copy over some config changes, and then CMD is run, run Influx. Simple as that to start it up. Um, Point being, customers, everyone builds their own, I shouldn't say, well, yeah, I mean, whether they're cloning from elsewhere or not, the customer is responsible for the creation of their container and then pushing it to the devices. So, but um, I think we are good. Let me switch my camera back. No need for you to stare at the bright white LEDs any longer. Um, and at the end of that process would be the dashboard showing my temperature and humidity in here. Of course, whether this device is on my desk or a thousand miles or 10,000 miles away does not matter so long as David looks okay. like you're. Oh, he muted. must be switching his camera. Yeah. Let's go there back. There you go. go. Sorry. Right. Switching back. And cool. oddly enough, when you switch, um, it kills your screen share, but that's it. <laughs> well, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, David. That was uh, uh, really good. Yeah. You have to see it working. Um, another plug for Ross's video if you actually want to see it in action um, with the real examples, the video. Um, with Ross um, covers a lot of them and, and it was pretty good because there's a lot of the different industries um, Otherwise, thank you very much uh, everyone for attending. Um, I will end the session and uh, If you want to hang around, um, I'll be here until about six uh, if you want to hang around um, to network afterwards and uh, Next week uh, we have home edge and Ross industrial. So we'll uh, see you guys then. Thank you very much Thanks, guys. Thanks, Hans.